Welcome to the Be Effective Podcast. Now, before we get into this episode with Mr. Gary Tonin, we need to handle the business side of the house. This episode is brought to you by Effective Fitness Training. The EFT program is a science and research-driven fitness program that encompasses everything from strength training, nutrition, rehab programs, mobility programs, and much more. It is developed to support and allows you to improve in other necessary disciplines like jujitsu, vehicle tactics, etc. Click the link in the show notes and use code PODCAST for 10% off the life of your membership. Episode 28, Mr. Gary Tonin. You may know Gary, aka your mom's favorite grappler. That's right. Gary started wrestling in middle school, and then around the age of 14, he was introduced to jiu-jitsu. From there, that's all she wrote. Gary started training under Tom DeBlas and became one of Tom's most dedicated students, winning his first jiu-jitsu world title in 2008 at the age of 16. In 2013, Gary was awarded his black belt, not to mention a few accomplishments, IBJJF world champion, two-time IBJJF world nogi champion, five-time EBI champion, which is the Eddie Bravo Invitational, and more. Gary is also one of the first members of the DDS, which is the Danaher Death Squad. They are currently out in Puerto Rico, training and living a life of luxury. Gary is now focused on his mixed martial arts career and is one of the most impressive mixed martial artists and grapplers in the world. So without further ado, episode 28 with your mom's favorite grappler. Mr. Gary Tonin. Enjoy. Yeah, so you're in uh you're in Puerto Rico with the team? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When did you get back? Because I know you were you were in New Jersey for a while, right? Yeah. So I try to come home once a month. Uh right now, you know, I don't I don't technically have a fight signed, but they, you know, they told me, uh, July I'm probably fighting. So, uh, right now I'm treating it like I'm in fight camp. So I'm probably Good. not going to go home until after that's over unless something, you know, crazy happens. And, you know, they can, they tell me that like, in like several months, like I'm probably going to wait until after the fight. Um, I have, there's a new head instructor that's teaching there every day. That was one of my students, but, um, I still own the gym, you know? Yeah. I try to get there. Like, so being a businessman, professional fighter, yeah. supermodel, all, all kinds of things. You have a lot on your plate. I had Craig on uh, a couple weeks back. Oh, yeah. I'll so, bet. How was that? It, I mean, I had to have him on first. So he'd be first in something out of the whole DDS squad. So um, it was good, man. I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of you guys. Um, you know, I've obviously been following you guys for a while. I think it, I think what you guys do is is great. You know, you're probably the deadliest team uh, in the world when it comes to jiu-jitsu, at least from my understanding and from what I see, right? The numbers don't lie. Um, <laughs> you guys do a great job. So, Gary, so what, you know, um, you're always talked about as one of the best grapplers uh, to to watch, and obviously your skill level um, is is – Huge. I was actually just talking to a buddy of mine, Trent, right before we got on. And I was like, yeah, man, I'm about to have Gary on. And he's like, I just got a semi. Um, you know, he's uh he's kind of a younger guy training MMA. And he, <laughs> and he looks up to you, man. Like he looks at he, you know, he uh you know, there's a lot of guys that I train with that that love what you guys do in the, you know, in the stuff you put out. And you know, you know, so Gary, let's take it back to uh not so far like getting out of your mom's womb far, but let's go to kind of what got you interested in martial arts? You know, what, what was that starting point? Yeah. So, um, it's kind of ironic because, uh, you know, my, my father was around until maybe I was like nine and then the parents got divorced, you know, and I, yeah, I would see him every once in a while. I think like, you know, the arrangement was every other weekend or something, but you know, however, however it was, um, there wasn't like a heavy male influence for a long time. Uh, I think my mother remarried maybe when I was like 13 or so, you know, something like that. So there's a pretty big gap where it was just like me, my mom and my sister around, you know? So, I mean, dude, half the time when I was watching television, 
it would be <laughs> me watching like the Gilmore girls with my sister, you know, like, <laughs> it was, you know, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, I found my own like manly stuff to do to the best of my ability, but there wasn't a whole hell of a lot of guidance uh, until a little bit later in my life. Like when I was a teenager, you know, uh, it was just kind of like, I was just figuring it out as I went along. So um, as far as combat sports are concerned, like, I mean, I knew things like boxing existed. Um, I understood that wrestling existed because my cousins did it. Um, but I really, like, I certainly, you know, obviously when I was younger, MMA was just getting, just getting started. Uh, jiu-jitsu had been around for a little bit, but it was probably a much smaller sport. Um, I had never heard of any of those things. Uh, you know, I did a little karate. Like I knew, you know, I knew that there, that martial arts existed, but the martial arts that I do now, I had no idea existed until I was like 15 years old. You know, I like, I had no idea jujitsu was a thing. I didn't, I didn't know that, you know, um, or MMA, you know, uh, I didn't really even understand that MMA existed until I started doing jujitsu. Like I didn't, I didn't, that was a world that was completely unknown to me. So, um, I guess kind of how I got started was I had mentioned my cousins. Um, well, okay. So I did do like a little karate. I did that like when I was younger, but I don't really count that. I wasn't really, I, I can't remember a single thing, you know, I'm just flailing like, my yeah, arms breaking around. boards and shit. I hear you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, little yeah. ADHD kid. The most memorable moments I can remember from my, my karate classes was jumping over a bamboo stick. That was the most <laughs> exciting part. And that my aunt would my aunt would intentionally, my aunt was just like such a little troublemaker that she would intentionally get me uh, like multiple king size candy bars prior to the karate class just to see how hyped up she could get me before I went there. So cool. that's what she would do. She would feed me fucking candy and then I would go run around karate class like a wild man. The old school pre workout. Um, yeah, but I don't really consider that my introduction to like martial arts or my interest in it necessarily. I, that was kind of, I was so young that I didn't really, I, I mean, I don't even know when that was maybe like, like age seven or eight or something. So uh, I would consider my first foray into martial arts to be when I started wrestling. So my, my cousins were into wrestling a little bit. Uh, my mom's side of the family, the Lighthouser family, and uh, they all live in Pittsburgh. Um, I have a bunch of cousins out there, uh, aunts, uncles, that sort of thing. Whole mom's side of the family pretty much still lives there with the exception of I think one lives in Georgia, but the rest of them are all inhabiting the Pittsburgh area. It's a pretty cool area. Been there a bunch. Love it. Um, there's some decent wrestling out in Pennsylvania, as as you probably know, as many people know listening right. to this. But if you don't know, um, Pennsylvania is a huge, um, I mean, the East Coast in general, but um, Pennsylvania is a big wrestling hub, uh, a hub and they, they have uh, some great techniques and great wrestlers out there. Um, so my cousins were into it. And I think if my cousins weren't into it, I don't think I would have even been allowed to do it because I had asked my mom if I could play football. Like I was a very aggressive, like I loved the idea of like uh, aggressive contact sports, but my mom was super against it. You know, she, I did baseball was like the only sport that I was doing uh, when I was younger. And, uh, and like, I think maybe a little soccer when I was very young and uh, my mom was not about it. She's like, very, she also worked at a children's hospital uh, for kids with special needs. So mm -hmm. Um, she got to see a lot of like traumatic brain injuries. So she wasn't a big fan of anything, uh, that involved possible traumatic brain injury and football was a big one. And that, you know, it's funny that she was even worried about it because that was way before anybody even really knew that that was like a major problem in that sport. Um, I would say that it wasn't until my generation where anybody even realized that that was a major problem. Um, you know, CT and all that kind of stuff. Right. So um, but she recognized it as an issue. She wouldn't even let me participate. She's like, absolutely not. Football is too dangerous. And I'm like, oh man, you know? So then eventually, I guess maybe through conversations with my, uh, with my uncle, um, who, who had all the kids that were doing wrestling, my cousins, maybe he talked her into it or, or something. And, or maybe the fact that they were doing it and they were okay, made her feel more secure about the idea. So she gets me involved in wrestling. I had ADHD, tons of extra energy. You know, I was getting involved in all kinds of sports and activities uh, at this point. So sometime around probably 10, 11, something like that. Uh, I, I became a, a wrestler. Um, my number one move when I first started wrestling was to back up when the match started. So the referee would say, go. 
I would back up to as, as far as the edge of the perimeter would allow me. And then I would sprint forward as far, fast as I can and then try to like tackle the guy until finally a referee like yelled at me and told me I wasn't allowed to do that anymore. No more Leroy so, Jenkins. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So as it turns out, I just, I just found a way to, to cheat my mom into allowing me to do football. So <laughs> hey, <that laughs> because works. I was just tackling guys. So, yeah. um, so yeah, man, I started doing that. I really loved it. I did it for, you know, a few years. Uh, I was, I was much more engaged in it at the beginning. As I got a little bit older, uh, it just became another activity that, uh, that I did that was fun. And, and I did a bunch of different sports. Um, I've mentioned this on a number of different interviews that I was kind of looking for this thing that I was going to do that all of a sudden I was going to be amazing at. And I, I think that came from like a, a misguided mindset from watching a lot of uh, movies and, you know, the Disney channel and shit like that. I just kind of thought that like one day I was just going to like find the thing that I was just, I was just going to be so much better than everybody at, at or something like that. Right. You know? Okay. And I think I was, I think I was exceptional at like a lot of sports, like I probably just from sheer athletic ability. I just did a lot of, uh, I was just used to moving my body around. So like if I went into a new sport, I picked it up pretty quick, but that notion that I was talking to you about just doesn't, it doesn't really exist. You know, uh, I think in some people's minds, they think it does that like, Oh yeah, man, you're, you're tall and athletic. Like you're just going to be an amazing basketball player. It's like, well, no, there's like a, a lot more, like if you're just the kid that's showing up to practice, which, which was me, you know, I'd show up to practice. I had a good after that. Like I never put in any extra effort in. I wasn't watching wrestling matches. I wasn't, um, I wasn't asking my mom to get more involved with other, you know, other aspects, maybe other clubs or something like that to get me better at that sport or putting in any extra work, you know, uh, for that thing. So when I started doing jujitsu and the way that I got there was a friend of mine from wrestling um, mentioned it to me. He's like, Oh, Hey man, you know, uh, I do this jujitsu stuff at first. Cause remember I told you, I literally didn't, I didn't know what jujitsu existed. Right. When he first told me about jujitsu, I just told him it was bullshit. I didn't think it was real. Like <laughs> he just goes, his name was Chris Trout. And uh, he was doing jujitsu at the time. And uh, he's like, yeah, you know, it's like this wrestling stuff that we do, but you try to break each other's arms and you try to strangle each other. And I'm like, yeah, Chris, uh, that's, you know, what are you talking about? Was like talking about like pro wrestling? Like, this is not, this can't be a thing. Like children are not allowed to go into a padded room and try to break each other's arms. Like there's no right. way that that's, that's a real activity that exists. That's the way that my brain was working at the time, you know? And I just hadn't been exposed to anything like it. Um, so finally he takes me to like a tournament. I get super interested in it. I love it. You know, I love the idea uh, of, of the, you know, a different rule set for a grappling exchange, you know, cause I'd been doing wrestling all this time and, and I was getting kind of stagnant with it. You know, it's, it, I'd been doing it for a number of years and I, I didn't really feel like it was going anywhere. I didn't have like a, too much amazing coaching, you know, a lot of rec coaches that just, you know, they, they did their, they did the best that they could, but uh, I, I wasn't learning really at a high rate, you know? And when that, when that tends to happen, you feel like you plateau, when you feel like you're not really getting better at something, it's harder to stay engaged with it, you know, especially when you're younger, especially ADHD. It's like a, you know, I I need something to grab my attention. And, and it was, it wasn't really doing it for me anymore. So when I saw this new thing, I was like, oh man, that's cool. You know, let's see, let's see what that's about. I got interested in it. I was involved in it for a little bit um, and kind of phased out of it because the only place that was close to me was too far away. I was in Bayville. And I was living in Lacey and I couldn't drive at the time. I was like 14 years old. So uh, it was just logistically too difficult to make a consistent thing in my life. So finally, Tom DeBlas opened up a gym in uh, Lacey Township, I think, Fork River uh, to this. Well, I think initially Lacey Road, and he's been there for many, many years, probably like, you know, I'm thinking like a decade now. Um, He just expanded, got bigger and bigger. And, uh, yeah, man, I, once I found that, uh, I was able to go every day. I could ride my bike there, you know, at 15 years old, I, it was like maybe a 10 minute, 15 minute bike ride from my house. So, you know, I was able to, I was allowed to do that. And, yeah. and then I could show up every single day. And, and remember what I was telling you before, like the idea that like, I thought I was just going to find this thing that I was amazing at. Well, Tom kind of helped me realize like, well, no, man, like you're going to have to like really work hard at this thing. If you want to be better than everybody else. 
So I would see him put all this extra effort in. He's driving to go train all these different places. He's putting in all this extra work to do workouts on the side of, of whatever the thing is. I was so obsessed with the idea of every second of every day, how could I get better at this thing that I'm really interested in? which had never happened to me with these other sports. I never came home from baseball and was like, Oh my God, like I got to go watch, you know, such and such person pitch. Like I want to, I want to see how their mechanics are and get better at it. Like I never thought that way, but with jujitsu, it it occupied my every, every second of it. And uh, eventually as I got better and better at it, had more and more success. I built a level of confidence that, Hey man, this could be something that, uh, that I could really stick with. And maybe it might be something that, um, not only am I going to do for the rest of my life, but could become my life. And the beginnings of that, because back then professional jujitsu wasn't a thing. And I wasn't in any, any sense of the word involved in mixed martial arts at the time. My main thought was, oh, I could open a school like Tom did, you know, and I'll be able to run. That's how I'll make a living. You know, I'll open a school and I'll teach students and, and that's how I'm going to do it. You know? So that's kind of, I would say that's my origin story roughly, you know, and the MMA came way later. That, that came like another decade after that. So. So did you get your black belt under Tom? Yes. Yes. Um, I primarily trained under Tom probably all the way up until Brown belt. Uh, Then I went to college at Rutgers. Okay. And when I started going to college at Rutgers, um, it became difficult to train with Tom consistently. So I was still going there every once in a while, but he just wasn't, uh, my main in, uh, instructor, I really didn't have an instructor at all for that period of time. I would say, I mean, he was my instructor. You know what I'm saying? Like sure. I wasn't taking yeah, classes. Yeah. I wasn't taking classes from any one person at that period of time. Right. Um, I would go to his school. Then I would drive to New York and maybe take a class with John or Henzo or whoever happened to be teaching. And uh, I would drive to Homedale. There was a Henzo Gracie school over there. I was going Ricardo Almeida's place. I was going all over the place. So for like, right after I like, well into my brown belt, I started basically cross training all over and didn't, I was uh, kind of just nomadic for probably like a year or two. Um, and then after that, I kind of settled in at Henzo Gracie Academy with John Danaher. And yeah. uh, that was in, in that year or two where I became nomadic, I kind of, uh, I think that's when I got my black belt. I think I got my black belt right before my first ADCC appearance. So okay. uh, up until that time, um, yeah, mo- like 99% of my training was done with Tom. And then there was a little bit of training done with other people. How, how old is Tom to blast? Is he like 106? <laughs> Looks a little older now, but yeah, uh, I think, man, like maybe 36. He's probably like 10 years older than me, I think. Really? Dude, man, he's such a, he's such a solid dude. Um, one of my sorry, buddies, nice Alvarez. Me, I'm crazy. I'm 29. What am I saying? Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe like, <laughs> I don't know why I said, like, like somehow in my head, I'm 26 again. I don't know how yeah, that happened. No, I wish. I mean, yeah, no <laughs> shit, fuck man. I, uh, I trained this afternoon and then I went to go lift and I'm like, what am I doing? I'm in like my mid thirties. Like I'm a fucking, I feel like I'm going to break at any second. Right. But I'm like, no, I'm just going to keep on going. So, so back to what I was saying. So one of my buddies in my Ruben Alvarez is, uh, he's under Tom to blast too. He got his secondary black belt under Tom. He's a, he's a yeah. top in the Miami area. Um, yeah, I'm familiar. he was, he fought against Ryan Hall back when he was 18, did some, uh, did some kind of tournaments there. Yeah. I don't know if you know him. Really notable. And, uh, he was at the time of when he was competing, he was very revolutionary for, uh, for his era. Um, there wasn't a lot of people doing a lot of the things that he was doing. He's actually ironically submitting people from, um, for those of you that are jujitsu nerds that might happen to be listening to this, he was submitting sure. people from a Remy Ashikrami, which is like a, uh, like a position that it's actually exceptionally hard to finish people from. So it was pretty impressive that he was able to get a lot of submission victories that way. Um, so he, he was, uh, like I said, at the time, like way ahead of the game, I think. Yeah. So how did you get um, involved with John and Henzo in New York? Cause I know um, I watched a piece on you not that long ago, but it was based like the day in the life of Gary Tonin and basically all you guys and the shit you went through every day from, waking up to eating breakfast to getting on the subway, getting into the city training and then sleeping and going to your school to train your students and then fucking doing it all over again. I mean, what was, I mean, so how'd you kind of get in that, in that, uh, kind of in that area? Yeah. So, um, the way that that routine ended up working out. So first of all, like I told you, the, 
the thought process when I first started getting, you know, deep diving into this whole thing was I'm going to open and run a school. Then somewhere right around after my first ADCC appearance and my match with Cron Gracie, which uh, was like a very famous match. I escaped like an arm bar and like came back in the last like four minutes of the match and then ended up losing like in the last like 10 seconds or something. Um, it was a by great submission. Match, by the way. That was a great match. Points and then you know dubs me at the end. And like there's literally like seconds on the clock. And like I didn't have a corner at the time, uh, because it was in China, you know, like there was no way I was gonna be able to get anybody to come out there with me. And uh, you know, I had no idea how much time was left. So anyway, but it doesn't matter. He he choked me regardless. It's not like (laughs) it's not like there's any excuse for that. So um but, you know, that was a match that had, you know, kind of elevated my name. Um, prior to that, probably my most, uh, my biggest match maybe was like, I had a 0-0 decision match with JD, JT Torres in Abu Dhabi Trials. And, you know, that was really big. Um, and that was when I was like a purple belt, like way earlier. So, you know, I started getting my name out there. I was competing, uh, competing on a lot of different stuff, but the pro shows didn't really exist. Like, um, there would be like show, like, Grappler's Quest was like the only organization that I can think of that was offering any amount of money to somebody to compete with the exception of ADCC. ADCC, for anybody who's listening that doesn't understand, is kind of like the Olympics of our sport, of no-gi grappling anyway, and only happens once every two years. And you either have to be invited or you have to participate in a trials event, uh, like a qualifier, in order to qualify for the tournament. So it doesn't happen all that often. So your money-making opportunities are slim to none. Well, back in this era of jujitsu, there was just literally nothing. And so the only way to make a living in jujitsu, in jujitsu was to teach, you know, you either had to run a school or you had to be somebody like John who was in a, you know, in a location like New York city where you got thousands of clientele where you could teach privates all day, you know, maybe you wouldn't ha- technically have to own a school and you could make a living doing that. Cause that's how John was doing his thing. So, um, yeah, so I, I was still trying to be one of the best in the world in addition to teaching at my school. Cause in my thought process was, Hey man, you know, I'm still young. I still am, at, you know, uh, doing really well at this. Um, I think I have uh, a lot of, uh, you know, potential to potentially do even better than I'm already doing if I continue to hammer at this. Um, so, you know, either, first of all, just for myself, like I wanted to see how far I could take it. Um, second of all, for the school that I was teaching at, I figured, Hey man, the better I do competitively, um, you know, the better, the more students I'll have, et cetera. My name will get bigger, even though I knew that that's not a huge part of the business. It's still helpful, right? Like if you have a recognizable name, it's definitely going to add to um, your ability to get clients on some level. Right. Absolutely. So that was my thought process, you know? So I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm seeking out in addition to teaching my classes every night, I I'm, you know, I know how it works, man. You know, like you got to try to take every second of every day to get better. If you want to be at an elite level, it's just the way that it is. I mean, maybe it's a little bit of a psychosis. Maybe it's like, maybe it's not a he- the healthiest thing in the world. I don't know. I think more than, more than likely it's probably, probably true that that's it's, there's probably more something wrong with people that need to try to be in that like 1% area in whatever it is that they're doing. Um, but nonetheless, that's what I wanted. So I knew that like just training with my students at night wasn't going to cut it, you know? Um, so I was seeking out training in the mornings and afternoons. Now at this time I had transportation and stuff. It was much easier. I could have driven back to Tom's, but Tom really only had night classes. So I was like, oh man, what can I work with that's in the mornings and afternoons and still be able to get away with teaching my classes? So I started going up to Henzo's a lot because Henzo's having being in New York city had so many classes available that it was very easy to get to morning and afternoon classes. So it kind of, the, the idea of being at John's classes was kind of happenstance initially. Like, it's just like, Oh, this is the guy that's teaching the morning and afternoon classes, you know? So I'm just here trying to take, take, you know, whoever was here, I was going to be taking these classes because I'm trying to get better. So I start going up, uh, I start going to those classes. I build more of a relationship with John. Probably the the probably the turning point in my relationship with John because it's very difficult to get close to John. I probably said up until this point maybe three words to the guy because he's a very intimidating, like much more so back then than now, uh, especially before he had gotten his hip surgery. He was just like an angry dude on the mat every day. 
like not somebody that you were interested in approaching at all, you know, right. even at a question, everybody, you could just see in everybody's face on the mat, like, we're just not going to fuck with this guy today. You know, it would have to be like a really good day. You know, maybe he got laid the night beforehand. I don't know. You could see him maybe crack a, <laughs> he got a new rash a guard, story. something. Yes. And then you're like, okay, maybe I can ask him a question today. Yeah. But I would always stay, stay, keep my distance. So finally, one day, like, uh, George St. Pierre is preparing for Nick Diaz. And I guess, uh, John had been watching me train and he goes, Hey man, you know, I think you'd be a good, um, you're a good training partner for George for the grappling aspects, because you're very scrambly, you're very similar to that kind of style. So I'd love to bring you out to Montreal and, you know, to participate in his training. I was still in, in college at the time, you know? So, um, I was, I was taking a full schedule. I took 18 credits a semester cause I wanted to graduate on time. Um, studying exercise science and, uh, <clears throat> that required me to miss, I would have to go up to Montreal like once a week. It would require me to miss like a few classes on Fridays. So I would, you know, I explained it to the teachers that I was, I was with and they, they were more or less on board. I had one problem with one guy that was kind of a jerk off, but I'm like trying to explain it. I'm like, guys, it's like if Michael Jordan asked me to <laughs> help him prepare for a championship basketball game like what do you not understand can i please take your fucking finance exam on a different day you jerk off you dumb idiot like this is it wasn't even the course that was that that, like this guy did this to me it was like an elect like not an elective but like um i was taking it as a minor like it wasn't even like part of my it was like a i don't know it was like finance for entrepreneurship or something and the guy's like no you have to take the exam on this day i'm not willing to do anything else so i had to miss one training session with george because this fucking idiot i wish i knew his name i'd love to just say it on the podcast so please do but i don't remember so (laughs) but anyway so yeah i was dealing with that dude at the time i was getting like four hours of sleep a night like Cause I'm taking all these classes in school. I'm trying to train. I'm trying to teach at the same time. It was, it was crazy. So, um, yeah, man, I just started to get a little closer with John after that. You know, we were taking these flights together up to Montreal. We had some conversations and then I started going to more of his classes, um, specifically. Uh, and, uh, I met Eddie Cummings, uh, who was an integral member of the team at the time. And, uh, he brought me to the, the worst classes in the world, which were the, you know, the like 8 a.m. classes, 8 a.m. with an asterisk. It really, really depended on when John decided to get there. But right. in order to get to an 8 a.m. class in New York City, when you live in central Jersey, I don't know if anybody knows how this works, but in order to get to somewhere by at, by 8 a.m. in New York City, where everyone's trying to get to that early in the morning by 8 a.m. when they start their jobs, it literally takes fucking two hours sometimes to get there. Like, no matter how you do it, you drive, you fucking take the train, whatever it is, dude, it's a disaster. It's a, it's a nightmare, no matter how you shake it. So that's why you left, I, right? <laughs> yeah. Eventually, yeah. you know, okay. Five years later, I wish, <laughs> like, I wish I endured that for like, you know, uh, you know, a half a decade before oh, that, man. but yeah, but yeah, man, it was a wild time. And, uh, you know, for what it was worth, it's like I told you, I did everything that I needed to do to be where I'm at today. And I'm very happy for it. I don't know if I wanted to keep up that lifestyle, you know, for the rest of my life. I think it was, it was good and important for me to endure that for the time that I did, but I'm very happy to be in a different place in my life now um, than I was back then. It's not like I'm not still working hard, but I'm not like literally working like an 18 hour day every day. You know what I mean? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, man. And so I kind of want to talk about, I want to kind of want to talk about Eddie Cummings. Cause I, cause I'm a huge Eddie Cummings fan. Oh yeah. How long is how long? Well, I don't, I don't even know what he's doing. I don't, he doesn't post anything. Doesn't really, I don't, who knows Nobody's what the fuck Eddie's doing. The same boat is probably almost everybody on the planet. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, I mean, he was, you know, he was one of the, you know, one of the revolutionary, leg lock guys, at least to my understanding, right. He kind of, he kind of was using them and was having a lot of success in some high level matches. How long or did you train with him? Was he a big influence on your game um, or, or like yeah, him and John absolutely. together? 
Yeah, no, absolutely, man. Um, Eddie was definitely, like I told you, he was kind of the initial reason that I started showing up to the morning classes. I didn't even know the morning classes existed at Hanzo's. Um, I don't, for whatever reason, maybe they weren't written on the schedule or something, or maybe I saw it and was like, fuck that 8 a.m. shit. Uh, and I didn't, you know, and I didn't know John <laughs> well enough to know that it was that valuable of a class. But once I, had, once, you know, it, it it's hard, I probably for the, now he, John's got a lot more exposure. So maybe people understand, you know, cause he's got all these DVDs out and a lot of people have seen it and all that kind of stuff. Um, but man, when you, when you, when you get it with John and when you finally, you know, around him enough and, and you've, you've taken enough lessons or maybe now listen to enough of his DVDs. I don't know. I've never actually watched any of his DVDs. I mean, I see the guy every day, so I have no reason to, right. but it's a walking um, DVD for you. What's that? He's basically just a walking DVD for you. I, uh, just like I told Craig, I said, that motherfucker has about half of my 401k in his bank account. Um, <laughs> Fucking, he's yeah. like, yeah, I'm gonna release another one and another one. I'm like, dude, they're fucking two and a half, you know, two and a half hours long a section, and there's 20 <laughs> sections in a fucking DVD. Like, I can't even get through the, you know, the yeah. leg lock one until you release the fucking open guard one, and then you got the yeah. closed guard one, and then the front headlock series. I'm like, Jesus, John, fucking. Yeah, he's. A, I mean, he's an incredible teacher. You know, I, I guess anybody that's ex- been around it and been exposed to it enough, it's just something different than what you're gonna get almost anywhere in the world. And once you realize that if you're around the guy, you're like, man, how can I get more? You know, obviously now the public is exposed to his DVDs. So that's exactly what you're communicating. You want to buy every single beat. Like that's that feeling. Like, you know, I was in the same place except for, I wasn't purchasing his DVDs. I'm seeing this guy, you know, teach live classes. And I'm like, fuck man. I'm like, this guy clearly knows some shit that other people don't fucking know, you know? So I got to be here, you know? So when Eddie told me, Hey, you know, he's teaching these classes, you know, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, I was like, all right, let's, let's do it. You know, if I got to wake up early, I got to wake up early. I'm used to losing sleep. Fuck it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, Eddie get, got me started with that. And he was obviously an integral, uh, part of the team uh, initially, uh, and, uh, was a main training partner for me, uh, for many years. Um, he definitely had an influence on me, uh, in terms of, just the leg lock game in general, Eddie was so sharp. I would say not just the leg lock game submission, just the idea of being a a very submission oriented fighter Um, and not just a submission oriented fighter, but a well-versed submission oriented fighter. Now, this is the funny thing is most people just know Eddie Cummings for, uh, for his leg locking. And the reason that most people just know Eddie Cummings for his leg locking is because for some fucking reason, Anytime Eddie would go to key, he would never do the kinds of things that he would do in the training room. And like, obviously I get it. It's a different thing. You know, you go out and compete and there's different, different rules and you're nervous and all, and all these sorts of things. So I understand, but at the same time, man, I really wish that he, in his career and, you know, obviously he's not with us or anything like that anymore, but um, you know, just for, just for the sake of, you know, of his career and, and what I knew he was capable of. I really wish that the dude fucking opened up and showed everybody what, what he was able to do. Cause man, he was a real, he wasn't just great at leg locks. Like this, this is a real submission wizard. Like this dude could yeah. fucking hit people left, right, and center with all different kinds of techniques. So yeah, the most frustrating part about Eddie's game for sure was the leg locks. Cause it was what I was least experienced with. So in, in that way, I, I had to, you know, I had to like really, uh, I had to really pick up the pace with learning how to do that. Um, because if I didn't, I was just going to get submitted every two fucking seconds. Um, but there was a lot of other stuff that he would catch you with. Um, that was really frustrating too, whether it was arm bars, triangles, um, all different kinds of strangles and things that he became exceptional at as well. So, um, you know, uh, I think him training under John for that, for such a long time. And he, he also had a very obsessive, you know, kind of personality about movements and stuff. You know, the guy, this is a guy who like would take, would take class and just like prior to class and after class, just drill for hours and hours. That was his way of doing it. You know, my way of doing it was, you know, more training or more classes or whatever the case may be. His way of doing it was I'm going to drill incessantly all day, every day. You know what I mean? That's how he, that's how he, you know, made his advancements. Um, I tried to accomplish it more in the context of class and training, but anyway, uh, yeah, man, big influence. Um, and once I saw how effective a person that was very, 
good at a, a large array of submissions could be and how that could change the dynamic of a jiu-jitsu match and how it was just it was almost like jiu-jitsu was a completely different thing you know um when somebody was capable of doing that it was great so it was almost like hey like here's this guy who's teaching all these amazing lessons you got john danaher right and then eddie was one of his up-and-coming students who was showing up to the majority of his classes uh, every day and working really hard so i got to see those messages can, you know, kind of transferred to an athlete who is actively doing it and seeing how effective that could be. And that was at the beginning, like that was when Eddie wasn't even, uh, hadn't even been training under John for that long. So that was, that was just a little taste of what we would be eventually the whole team was going to be capable of doing. And once I saw that, I was like, Oh man, this is something special. I really want to be I really want to be involved with this. You know, I want to, I want to get better. I want to learn how to do this. And uh, yeah, we went through that process, man. We worked, we started with all, all the leg lock stuff and we got really sharp with that. And then John just started going through an array of all different kinds of submissions and, and making us better at all those different things. But, you know, to answer your question about Eddie, for sure, he's a, he's a big influence, um, you know, before, uh, before things started to drop off. So. Sure. Sure. Um, so Gary, I kind of want to talk about your last performance in the ADCCs and, I mean, obviously your performance was phenomenal. I think you had, you had the fastest submission, uh, yeah. correct? Yeah. Um, yeah. Via heel hook, inside heel hook, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. With um, a scissor takedown before that. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. That's right. Scissor takedown, which is, uh, which is one of your go-tos. Um, you're very good at that. And so I kind of want to talk about your prep prior to ADCCs, um, the camp that you guys put on when it comes to the, ratio of i know you're a big workout guy i've been seeing your stories you're working out at 1 a.m trust me man it's like one of the best times i used to be a big late night workout dude and then i would find out that i couldn't fucking sleep uh till about 3 a.m then i wake up at fucking 7 a.m to go you know i'm just fucking talking fucking preaching to the choir here so yeah. when you're preparing for the adccs obviously you have the best nogi grapplers in the world coming from all over just like you said for those that are listening gary just described what that is how long is the camp? What does your training and conditioning look like? What does your nutrition look like? What does your training look like prior to ADCCs? Yeah. All right. So that particular ADCC, uh, the one that you were just speaking of where I got the fastest submission, uh, that particular ADCC, um, my prep wasn't amazing. Um, I think a few things happened. I think I had an elbow surgery, if I'm not mistaken, before that, like an arthroscopic thing. Um, I had gotten, or maybe it was the stem cell treatment or maybe the stem cell treatment came after that. I'm not hundred percent sure, but basically I think it was the, I think it was arthroscopic surgery because if it was stem cells, I probably would have had them wait until after the ADCC, but the arthroscopic surgery was a must because I literally like my elbow, if I, I couldn't fully extend it, it would like extend to like here and yeah. I couldn't flex it. Like I couldn't touch my, my, my shoulder with my thumb. I could like only get to like here. Um, so I, they, they took some bone chips and cartilage and shit out of my elbow, which didn't fully fix it. I had to get stem cell, uh, treatment later because it, it started to flare up and cause problems. There's a tear in my UCL. So, um, from just years of fucking abuse and you know, whatever. So, um, they told me they're like, they're like, Hey, we could fix the UCL. Uh, they do a, a surgery called Tommy John surgery. Like this is a common, uh, tongue for it. Um, it's actually a great surgery. Uh, one of the few surgeries where when they physically do the repair, because most, most of the time when you get some sort of surgical operation done with, you know, tendons, muscles, uh, and joints, et cetera, more than likely the results of the surgery are that you're not going to be able to perform at hundred percent after that, right. like going to be better than when you were injured, but it's not going to be back to like a hundred percent. Uh, what they find with the the Tommy John surgery, I think, is that you actually end up gaining um, more leverage in that joint because I think where they attach it, they attach it maybe in a different. I, I have to I have to reread, so I, I might be misspeaking here, but I think they attach the tendon in a different place, or maybe they use some other tendon that's stronger, something like that. Um, but for, I remember reading when I was in um, school for exercise science that they would do this surgery and like pitchers when they would come back would actually throw faster. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's a promising surgery, but the problem is it would put me out for a year, you know? So I was like, fuck that. 
we're going to do arthroscopic and we'll be back in eight weeks. Okay. Perfect. So, <laughs> so I did that, you know, I was back in eight weeks. I thought I was going to be fighting. Um, I was doing some negotiations with contracts. It didn't end up working out. Um, so I didn't have a fight scheduled. So I was like, Hey, don't have a fight scheduled elbows. Good to go. Let's do this. And I kind of like, I want to say I, maybe I jumped into ADCC camp that they were doing maybe like four weeks ahead of ADCC. Wow. Not that, not to suggest that I wasn't training before the elbow surgery or anything sure. you know, in jujitsu. I, you know, even though I was doing MMA, I was still doing jujitsu practices, but to say the actual process that you're talking about, which is a preparation for the tournament and how that changes uh, what we do. I only really participated in that maybe for a month before that ADCC. Oh man, that's impressive though. And your performance was, was Thank you. great. It was great. Thank you. I mean, you, I mean, you also too, you talk about that natural athletic ability, right? That's, that's, that plays a huge, I mean, there's some guys, and again, I'm preaching to the choir here is, you know, so I've been training jiu-jitsu consistently for about four years, three to four times a day. Right. And I, and I do study, I'm kind of like you, I'll get submitted by something. I'm like, fuck, now I got to watch four hours of fucking John talking to learn how to either get out of it or reverse it or whatever. And not to fucking toot your own horn, but, but you did just release a instructional called escaping the system. So it is about escapes and then going into submission, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yeah. That's, a, that's, I would say, I can't say for sure. I'd have to look at the numbers. I don't really look at the numbers like Gordon does every second of every day. But, uh, <laughs> I don't, I have no idea. Really, Gary, my- you don't post about that all the time. No. <laughs> I don't know what my numbers are in terms of DVD sales, but based off of the responses that I get, the exit, the system DVD, it was the, is the number one thing that I get like messages about. And I get, I get messages probably every day. Somebody telling me like, Oh my God, dude, this changed everything for me. So yeah, I'm super excited about that. Cause I thought that was a huge part of what made me successful um, in jujitsu. Cause it's like, it's weird, man. It's like this, it's like a safety blanket. It's like, if I believe that, no one can touch me with submissions. It opens up like a whole new world of what you can do when you grapple. Like, because a lot of the decisions that you make when you grapple are based on risk assessment. So it's like, okay, I could do this, but I'm offering my opponent my arm, but I'm offering my opponent my back. And that was actually, in my opinion, Eddie's, Eddie's biggest problem, you know, going back to Eddie for a second. Sure. Is in Eddie's risk assessment, when he would go into a match, it was like, if a guy had a good guillotine, the risk assessment was if I even give us fucking this much, a tiny bit of opportunity for a guillotine, I'm getting finished and I'm going to lose this match. Right. That was the way that Eddie's mind would work. He's very like self-destructive. Um, right. So it prevented him from like opening up and taking a, a large degree of risk. Everything was very calculated and anything that he was going to do was going to be very, um, risk averse, right? Whereas my whole idea of jujitsu was, Hey man, I'm going to be really, really good at getting out of all of these terrible positions and submissions. And then when it happens in a match, it's like, it sucks, but it's like, all right, whatever. I work out of this arm bar, I work out of this triangle, the back take, whatever. And now I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. And there's also like a certain element to that too, which is like kind of disheartening. It's like when you like get somebody and you're like really close to subbing them or something, there's like a, And now all of a sudden, like they're on your back or like all of a sudden, like they have you in a submission. You're like, holy fuck, what just, what just happened there? You know, like I had the the best though. That's like the best. It's the best feeling. It's funny because that's the reaction from a lot of people I competed against. You know, I remember like Gilbert Burns uh, had said something similar to me. Um, What was his name? Um, Halleck Gracie too. Trying to think if there was any others that literally came up to me after the match. Like, Hey man, like what you know, I really felt like I was doing really well there. And then, then like all of a sudden I was like caught in that thing. Like, how did that happen? And like, I had to explain it. And that's, and that's kind of like how my game is. So anyway, I don't know what we were talking about. hundred percent. Yeah. The exit, the exit, the system stuff, um, I think helped a lot of people. Um, and I think it will continue to help people because having that, you know, that, that cliche, having, having a good defense is a good offense or vice versa, whatever the case may be. Sure. This DVD goes, it does a good job of like, of like not only keep keeping you safe, but also keeping you in the mindset of, well, as soon as I, I free myself from danger, like, Hey, we're going to go right back on the attack, which is kind of cool. Yeah. And I think what's so good about the way 
because I've seen your instructionals. I've seen Gordon's. I've seen Craig's. I've seen John's. Basically, the entire teams. Um, so you're welcome. But uh, <laughs> no, but appreciate it. The way you guys teach is is very concept related. Like you don't like you guys. Don't, you guys just don't teach moves, right? And that's one thing where I feel like if you look at my Instagram saved history, it's like 16 seconds of like a hundred different types of moves, right? That I'll probably never ever use or never ever you know whatever. But when I invest my time in learning, I try to, you know, pick a section and you guys, me and where I'm at in my journey is obviously like middle blue belt. Right. And so the whole like concept game, like the concept of open guard concept of closed guard, that's the way you guys describe it. Isn't over my head. It's also, um, you know, not like below me, but, Mm -hmm. but it's also the point where I can, I can really benefit from, how you guys teach. And I don't know if that's how the way that John teaches sure. live. Um, but man, it's, 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 it's just great. Cause right now for me, the, just the learning the concepts in different positions is just a good, really right now a game changer for me. I do remember the original question now, which was, it was about okay. 80 rep and I'll eventually answer. Oh yeah, that. that's right. I want, to touch on that. What you were just, I want to touch on what you were just talking about for a second. Sure. Uh, you were talking about um, how, uh, you're talking about concepts. So, okay. So you got, let's just throw a number out there. A uh, hundred thousand moves. I don't know. Let's say we have that. Okay. That's a lot. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, assuming, you know, we're talking from every single different position, wrestling, included, all these different, you know, let's just throw that number out there. Who the fuck knows how many moves there actually are. Right. You could probably just continue to, you know, depending upon what you want to do. As far as effective moves, you probably narrow that down a little bit more. Um, Or like whatever moves you consider to be the most used in high level competition, right? And then the, the human mind to be able to like wrap your head around that kind of a number, right? And to be able to not only recall, right? So like, not only for me to be able to verbally tell you, hey, this is how you do this move, but for <laughs> in the middle of not a life or death situation, because you know, we're we're just doing jujitsu here, but you know, in a in a high pressure situation in competition where you know the stakes, the stakes are winning and losing, and that's a big deal to you as an athlete. Um to be able to recall thousands and upon thousands of moves and the little tiny details involved with them and all those sorts of things. And to be able to, man, that's fucking tough and it, impossible, I would argue. Um, and so, you know, the way you get around that as an athlete is you pick several different things that you drill heavily, you know, over time and you try to build a certain sense of muscle memory with those things. Right. So your body does it over and over and over again. And it's like riding a bike. You don't think about it after a while. You know, it's not something that you do have to recall. It's just something that your body does instinctually. Oh shit. There's an exposed arm. I wrap up an arm bar. I've practiced this mechanic a thousand fucking times. I don't have to think about what to do. I, my body just does it. Right. Um, but there's also something to what you just mentioned, which are these concepts, which I think for the purposes of learning, um, are very, very helpful, especially if like, like you had mentioned, like time constraint wise, there's so much information out there, you know, that John's putting out there that I'm putting out there that Gordon's putting out there, this, that, and the other thing. If I now don't get me wrong, the mechanics are important. Super. There's that, that does help separate us from some other teams and some other people that are doing what they're doing. Absolutely. It's, it is a very important thing. But if I, I would say that there was one thing to take away more than anything else, it would be conceptual information. Now it's hard to pick and choose and figure out exactly where that's going to be in a DVD necessarily. But anytime you hear it's your a light bulb should go off in your head. Anytime you hear something that seems like a, almost like a philosophical or a, uh, you know, something that, that seems like a concept as opposed to a specific movement. It's something that you really want to burn into the back of your brain, because as far as concepts are concerned, there's not a hundred thousand concepts in jujitsu. Right. It's a much, much lower number. I, I can't necessarily say exactly what that number is. Again, you know, more are created over time, you know, as, as technique uh, improves, but 
you know, let's say, let's say ratio wise, you know, it would be, you know, a thousand concepts versus a hundred thousand moves, you know, or something like that. Um, that is much easier to wrap your head around. And more importantly than it just being easier to wrap your head around, what it opens the door for you to do is now with that new concept that you just learned, if it truly is a concept that's that you're able to apply, um, more than likely it opens the door for your own individual experimentation and learning without the use of me, Gordon, John, whatever the case may be, you just take that concept and fucking run with it. And that's something that I, I think some people miss out on a little bit, whether it's when they're watching the DVDs or coming to a jujitsu class or whatever the case may be, those concepts are like the number one thing because ultimately like you don't get to, you don't get to take John's brain with you in the competition. You don't get to take my brain. You don't get to take Gordon's brain. You don't even get to take him to class really during your live training or anything like that. All you got is you, you know? And when you take those concepts, you get to make it about you. You know, you get to make it like, Hey man, I understand that controlling two legs, you know, is, is an easier way um, to take my training partner down than controlling one leg. It's like, all right, well now when I have one leg, what are all the different ways that I can get to the second leg? And it's like, all of a sudden, even without ever watching another wrestling DVD, you are the creator and you're going to be able to come up with every technique, maybe not every technique, but a large number of the techniques that are already out there. You're going to go, okay, well, I can get to the second leg with my hand. Can I do it in front? Can I do it behind? Um, okay. How am I going to do it with, um, with my feet? Okay. Again, it's so true. And it's like all of a sudden now you can play with this concept and you bend you bend this concept different directions and you go, okay, well, how far can I push this? Where does it still apply? Oh, wait a minute. That concept of controlling two legs to take somebody down. Oh, that kind of applies in a leg locking situation as well. Or sorry, I wouldn't even say leg locking. Let's, it does apply a leg locking situation, but that's different. It applies in a sweeping situation as well. Hey, if I can control somebody's two legs, it's way easier to sit them down. Right. Not just when I'm in standard wrestling. Right. And all of a sudden, as you stretch and twist these concepts, I think you understand the, the sport as a whole more. And as you understand the sport as a whole more, you get to make your own individual progress without so much of, you know, directly hearing somebody else tell you exactly what to do. You know, you create it yourself. And when you create it yourself, when you come up with your own answers, I think it sticks with you so much more. Than yeah, that's, you, yeah, that's so true. I... And I can tell you right now where I'm at, I'm really focusing on the off balance portion, right? And so I've watched John's open guard DVD and that's, I think that's predominantly in the gi. And then I've watched Gordon's open guard as well. <clears throat> I mean, obviously very similar things, right? And so, cause I, so I train both. I kind of go in phases. I'm just like, Hey, I'm going to just train no gi cause that's way more fun. Now I'm in the gi simply because of scheduling. Uh, it's either I'd do gi or I do nothing. And so I'd rather just, <laughs> right. Um, sure. You know, cause right now it's not that the schools are closed around us. It's that, that, you know, they had to slowly open classes for certain times, but I kind of go back to what you're talking about. The concepts is, you know, I think what you said is, is, is exactly what I'm doing is, is almost exactly where I'm at is, you know, how can I work certain movements or certain concepts? And just like you said, there's like a key word, like I'll be watching you know, uh, like a one hour section and then I'll just I'll be like, Oh shit. He said, you know, try to get your head or his head over your head. Right. Like, okay, that's check. All right. So now I'm going to focus on that when I go to class. Right. It's just like small shit like that. It's just, and you did, uh, you did something I saw on Instagram. I think you were doing one of those IGTV videos where it was like, get one foot inside. I mean, obviously you want inside control, right? That's, that's yeah. super optimal there, but are you talking about how just getting one, one like sticky hook inside of their legs. Yeah. That's like, I, I can't remember exactly what it was. I think it was like two or three weeks ago that it was posted on BJJ fanatics. Sure. And man, I, I've been doing that. It's just I was like, damn, this is like way like, again, a lot of people aren't studying like they should be or studying correctly. So when you find that right balance of how to study an actual instructional, which took me, dude, sometimes I would just like watch two hours of instructions be like, I literally remember four fucking minutes. I just wasted two hours of my fucking time. 
listening to John, put my ass to sleep. Yeah. Uh, and what I ended up doing is I actually got, I actually hurt myself a while, but I, hurt, I didn't really hurt myself. I had somebody hurt me in jujitsu. I was uh, <laughs> my buddy's first day jujitsu. Right. And so I was in Mount kind of when he started knocking and bucking, my foot got caught underneath his back and he basically just heel hooked me. Um, yeah, that happens. I've seen that happen a couple of times. Yeah. I actually, I actually did that to somebody once. Yeah. Super I fun. Like, I wasn't doing, I wasn't being a retard. I was just trying to escape Mount, but yeah, every once in a while your weight comes down on somebody's foot the wrong way and Mount and fuck people's knees. Yeah, no, it, it, it sucked. And so, uh, I ended up by one of those little grappling dummies, uh, and, contrary some people say hey it's not worth it it's not worth it man it's helped me so much with my leg game um because i wasn't able to stand up and really do a whole lot so i was like you know what let me just dive into this leg lock game so i obviously bought john's dvd because it was the thing to buy at the time um after spending you know uh the price of a small kidney i was able to now um you know get to cross ashi and you know you know learn reverse x guard and just the concepts of off balancing for me and that whole DVD was just like mind blowing. Like, and yeah. and still like, you know, going from lower body to upper body attacks, like the way you guys like systematically, literally, I know that word used a lot in jujitsu now, but the way that you guys do it is much more different than uh, other instructionals I've seen or the way that other people teach. Cause they just teach moves. Right. Sure. And you guys are actually linking things together, which I think is you're, you're learning what you're describing right now. And what I was describing a little bit before, maybe I didn't identify it. And this is something John stressed early on in our careers. Myself, Gordon, Eddie sat us all down. Nikki sat us all down and discussed this with us is you're learning how, how to think, right. And like how to rationally problem solve and to learn how to rationally problem solve on your own is probably the number one thing that you could learn. You know, uh, because if you learn how to do that, all of these issues that you're going to run into, no matter what, what it is that you're doing in the sport, if you can rationally problem solve, like you're going to be able to find some reasonable answer, you know what I mean? Or at least get pretty fucking close, understand right. or understand elements of it. You know, what's going on wrong? What's the problem? Okay. What's the main problem? What are the secondary problems? How do we fix the main problem? Okay, now let's address the secondary problems to the best of our ability. What are we able to do here? And then when as you, as you learn from John or or any of us, you know, because I like to believe that we try to convey similar ideas, um, you start to understand this rational problem solving ability over time if you're paying attention to the right stuff. Sorry, did you did you lose me for oh, a minute? Oh no, yeah, no, you're good now. Continue on, sir. Okay, jujitsu, unlike some other martial arts um, and some other activities that you may do, um, is uh, at least the way that I see the culture is predicated on your ability to convey information to other people. It there are jujitsu schools out there, probably the most the more unsuccessful ones, where people just go in and and they fucking beat each other up and they go home. But the more successful schools and the better environments to train in where you really feel like a community and you have like a real team, like you're helping each other out. And if you're going to be somebody that's capable of helping other people out, you have to be able to convey ideas and information. And it's hard to be able to convey ideas and information to other people when you don't really understand how to rationally problem solve. You're just kind of like, uh, put your foot here. And then somebody goes, why? And you're like, I don't know, just fucking do it. You yeah. know, and it's like, well, no, like, <laughs> why motherfucker? Like, tell yeah. me <laughs> you, you got to dig a little deeper than that, you know? Okay. And that's a cool thing about learning how to teach and, and teaching in general is, is you have to start addressing those questions, or at least I suppose if you're a good teacher, you probably should be, you know? And, uh, I think it helps not just you, but it, it typically it was probably going to help the people around you as well to start thinking like that. Yeah. I think explaining the why is yeah. extremely important, you know? kind of to dive into like the law enforcement world, like whenever we would teach something like tactics, right? Like why, why am I standing behind the vehicle as opposed to in front of the vehicle? Well, it's because you're putting mass in between you and someone possibly that is armed, right? So you want that mass to hopefully stop bullets if the motherfucker starts shooting at you, you know? Sure. So very similar concept when it comes to instruction, right? There's a lot of guys that are, are phenomenal, you know, jujitsu practitioners, but absolutely terrible instructors, right? They just... Sure. They can't explain, they can't regurgitate, they can't. And then, and then their students can't digest the information. And then 
do it, right? It's like, let me show you this move. And then I want you guys to go do it. And it's like, okay, like that's, that's great. But I, I'm not, I'm, you're not developing my mind. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and just like you said, to basically just think for yourself. Now, when it comes to um, your goals, Gary, what, yes. where do you see yourself in, in the next two, three years? Hmm. Two, three years. So I would say um, two, three years. So if all goes well, um, we're hopefully lining up a title fight with one now, you know, that's what I'm, I'm trying to work, you know, um, nothing is signed, you know, nothing's guaranteed, but, you know, hopefully, you know, I've won the title in featherweight division. Uh, I would like to, uh, I would like to move up to the lightweight division and try to win that division's title as well. Um, and there's a couple other super fights in that, in that division that I would like, like, for example, like Shinya Aoki, I think would be a good fight. Um, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a high profile match for me. Um, I think, uh, and also we have history. Like I had, I submitted him in a jiu-jitsu match. So, uh, in addition to, uh, me wanting that opportunity to challenge myself with somebody that I respect highly as a, as a good, uh, grappler slash MMA fighter. Um, I also think he deserves the opportunity to fight me. Um, because, I mean, he went out of his way to grapple me and it's not his sport. And right. you know, that was cool of him. I don't know if he wants the opportunity, but you know, hopefully it'll be on the table. I think that would be cool. Um, uh, Eddie Alvarez would be another, uh, another big, big name fight. Um, you know, I don't know how, how that would go, you know, it, whatever he wants for his career, you know, he's, he's loosely affiliated with the team too. He trains out of Ricardo's and stuff like that. So um, I don't uh you know, whatever they decide is, is the right option. But if, if any, if they offer me that fight and Eddie wanted it, I would love that opportunity, you know, um, because I think that would, would help elevate my career if I was able to win a fight like that. Um, another big name that they have in the organization is Sage Northcutt. Um, so I would love an opportunity to fight him. And uh, those are most of the goals that I have in one championship as of right now. I mean, John, uh, or sorry, uh, one championship signing, you know, new guys. I think they just signed John Lineker not too while, not too long ago. He's been winning a bunch of fights out there. Um, you know, so you never know what's going to happen. They may sign more guys that I'm interested in fighting and things, but that's the trajectory of like what I'm thinking about via one championship right now. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else. So yeah. So featherweight title, light, lightweight title. And, um, you know, some of those super fights that I mentioned, whether I have the lightweight title or not. Um, but that, that would be my goal. And then, uh, so, so that would probably put us, I'm guessing if things keep going the way that they're going in terms of the speed of which I'm getting fights, I would guess that that's going to probably put us somewhere around that three year mark, yeah. right? Two or three year mark. And we'll see what happens from there, man. You know, I, it, it's hard to say one way or the other. Um, I, I got to see how my body's holding up. Um, I'm, I'm interested in being the best MMA fighter that I could possibly be. But once things get to a point where I think that that's no longer possible, um, physically for me or anything like that. And, and I don't think it's in my best interest anymore. Uh, I may decide to, to walk away. I personally think, um, that, you know, that I could have a, a longer career than that, but it really depends. You know, right now I'm six and oh, every fight that I've had has been a very, you know, first of all, all of them were, were finishes except, for, except for the last one. Right. Uh, but even the last one was, was not just a unanimous decision, but like any idiot could have watched that fight without any prior knowledge and gone. Yeah. We're pretty obvious that that guy dominated. Like I took one shot. I got hit in the nose pretty hard with a knee and that was it. That was it. Everything Time else. I am pretty sure I controlled the whole fight. So yeah, I mean, I've had pretty dominant performances um, throughout my mixed martial arts career, despite being a very new mixed martial artist. Um, if fights keep going like that, I can fight for a long time. You know, yeah. I start having fights that are like brutal Rory McDonald, Robbie Lawler wars. Well, maybe not. I don't know. We'll see what happens. You know what I mean? Also like, forget about if my body can handle it. I mean, sometimes mentally that's just not, that doesn't sit well with you, man. Like I, up until this point, I've said this in a few different interviews, like as cool as it is to do MMA and like as much as I've enjoyed it, I really, I only know one part of MMA and that's winning. 
you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what it's like to walk out onto stage in front of thousands of people and lose and get into the cage and win and exactly. not just win, but typically submit the person, you know, I have yet to get in there and be in you, either not, not only have I not been in there and lost, but I've not been in there and taken significant damage, you know, in any of these fights. So it's like, how much do I really love MMA? You know, let's fucking find out when, when that sort of thing happens. I don't know. You know, yeah. maybe, when that, maybe when that happens, I go, you know what? Fuck this shit. You know, I'd like, <laughs> to, keep my brain. I'd like to keep my brain and I'm going to go home and yeah, and, and absolutely. So, I mean, with all that going on, you still looking for fights. Um, sure. Are you still going to be, you know, doing ADCCs and things like that? I'm going to try to mix it in, man. You know, yeah. because the title fight is on the, is on the register right now. And it's a, it's a possibility for me. I'm, I'm staying away from doing anything else except for that. Like, I'm just like, Hey man, let's keep my body in mind and focus on that thing and be as healthy as possible for that event. Um, after I win the title and maybe I'll start playing around a little bit more um and and do more grappling events or you know every once in a while so it's, it's highly dependent upon what's scheduled for me in terms of mma but i'm not opposed to it i still have never won adcc i've only ever gotten bronze so i uh i still have ambition to to do it you know and even if i had like i just i love grappling man you know yeah it's not um it's not like just because you win something all of a sudden it's over you know so um I'll always, I'll always love grappling and it's always going to be something that I enjoy competing in. So, um, you never know, man. I, I we'll see what happens. I also have a, we have a large number of teammates competing in ADCC this year. You know, we're, we're building the, for a long time, we were a very small team. It was like pretty much the only highly competitive athletes were like me, Eddie and, and eventually Gordon. Um, and now we're starting to build a pretty big roster. So more than likely the the ADC ADCC roster is going to be pretty packed this year. So I don't know what what room we'll even have as far as a team because you only get two athletes per division. Um, for me to jump in, and I, I give priority to the guys that are focused on jujitsu. So, right, yeah. I mean, you guys have straight studs on your squad. I mean, it's, everybody is a fucking <laughs> unit, dude. I mean, literally, I, I there's there's not one person besides. Ethan getting darsed the other night. Um, yeah. Which dude, he's a fucking unit, dude. I, uh, I'm just impressed of how, how strong he is. Like just from just, he's, right. a, he's absolutely. And I, I don't mean that in like a, he's strong, but sucks at jujitsu strong. Like he's like, he's just like a, you guys are all specimens, right? It's, it's just really great. It's, it's really cool to see how the elite of the elite train. Right. And you're a very humble guy, Gary. Like um, I know that Gordon was just talking about you about like how much you work, like just, just, you just don't stop, dude. I, you're out at 1am freaking working out. And then you wake up early as fuck to go train, train your MMA, train jujitsu, lift, you know, eat, you know, there's, you gotta make time to do other things, man. You guys are just, this is, and you actually kind of hit on it a while back about kind of like being borderline obsessed, like being that, if you want to be that 1%, you got to be that crazy. Like all you motherfuckers are that crazy. Right. Yeah. And that's why you're the best in the world. That's why people love watching you fight. That's why people love, you know, buy your instructionals. It's because it's, this is what you guys do. But my buddy Trent just sent me a text and he's like dying. Yeah. He wants me, he wants you to answer two questions. Oh boy. Here we go. I told him, he says leg locks and MMA. Pros and cons. Now, just to give you a quick background about Trent, he's about 185, purple belt, re- huge wrestling background, fucking scrappy. You guys, you guys kind of look alike, ugly as fuck, but just fucking studs. Um, mm-hmm. Dude, he's a, uh, yeah, he actually has a mullet, bro. He does. Yeah. He does. Super good dude, man. So, yeah, so leg locks and MMA, pros and cons there. Yeah, so... Uh, it's a lengthy conversation. At some point, I'm going to start doing MMA DVDs as well. Probably after I win the title, I think is probably the best time to do that. So, um, hmm, okay. First of all, it's highly dependent upon the skill level of the person applying them. Okay. Um, my advice as a coach to someone who is not very well versed in grappling, who is going to be uh, using them in their mis- mixed martial arts uh, fights uh, or plans to do so or is interested in doing them. 
Um, I would have different advice for a person like that than I would have for somebody like myself or somebody else from our team who has been doing this, you know, day in and day out for years where it's like, you know, uh, you know, leg locks like the back of your hand kind of, kind of thing. And, and not only that, not only do you know leg locks like the back of your hand, but like you got exit strategies and follow-ups and, and, you know, a game within a game and, and all these different things. So it's like, you know, it's a little less, you know, I talked about mitigating risk and kind of having a security blanket before by being highly skilled at that thing, it changes everything. You know, it changes the conversation. So let's, we're going to have a few different conversations about this. Let's the first one, let's have about the average guy who does mixed martial arts, who maybe would want to in, integrate some leg locks into their mixed martial arts and say, say like, Hey man, you know, I've, I've done some grappling. Obviously I do MMA. Um, you know, uh, maybe I'm primarily a striker or I'm kind of like, I have a mixed background or whatever the case may be, but I haven't really done too much of that leg lock stuff. I'm a little nervous to do it in, uh, in a mixed martial arts fight. So we're going to say the greenest, you know, the greenest person that you could be, but to the, to the, to the point where they at least still be capable of performing a move, right. A, A leg lock specifically. Right. So if I could get somebody capable of performing the movements, okay, whether it be an outside heel look inverted, whatever the case may be, obviously, probably, first of all, preference is always going to be inverted, um, especially in a fight because it's the strongest breaking, uh, as the strongest breaking potential. Okay. The conversation I would have with an athlete like that would be the following. I would say, Hey man, I would say, um, this is something that you're most likely going to integrate into your game when there is a minute to 30 seconds left in a round, a minute tops, you know, you got 30 seconds or to a minute left in a round. And, you know, you're like, you know, either, either you're already winning that round and you got, you don't got much to lose and you just want to add, you know, an opportunity to submit somebody uh, to the table or, Maybe you were losing that round and you want to do something that um, you want to do something you think might, you know, put the guy in danger, you know, but the, the, the important part is the reason I'm saying to do it in the last 30 seconds to the minute of the round is the biggest danger to doing a leg lock in a mixed martial arts scenario is having the other guy get on top of you or being in a situation where um, you're on bottom trying to entangle somebody's legs while they're punching you in the face. So you don't want that period of time if you're very green in that area to be a long period of time. You want it to be like, hey, man, I have enough time to try to maybe make something happen, but not enough time where when I fail, the other guy has a shit ton of time to capitalize, right? So that's what I would argue. That would be the first conversation I would have. Second conversation I would have is, well, okay, I know that I'm probably going to do this in like the last minute to 30 seconds of a round or whatever the case may be, because I'm not really sure what I'm doing. When would be the best time? Aside from, aside from the, uh, aside from the actual physical time, I mean, like opportunity wise, right? Like, so, so like, what is, um, what is the entry going to look like? For example, you know, to the leg lock, you know, assuming we're starting in a standing position. Well, there's many different entries, but I believe the bar none easiest in a stressful situation where you're not <clears throat> very well versed in leg locking would be to pin somebody to a fence. So if you're capable of pinning somebody to a fence, you can grab a leg and sit down and they can't go anywhere, you know, whereas in the open, you know, if you try to do some of the stuff that like, for example, like Ryan Hall has done, um, I think he, when he fought Gray Maynard, he did like a little, uh, or maybe it was, was it Gray or was it, am I thinking of when he fought? Um, I think I'm thinking of when he fought uh, BJ Penn. Yeah. When he did the Imanari roll to the backside 50, yeah, 50. Yeah. So like with what he did with BJ Penn, like you, if you don't really know what you're doing and you try to do something like that and you're in the middle of the octagon, you're getting smashed. Even if you don't get smashed, though, it's it's not hard to miss if you don't really know how to set it up. And, you know, like 
it's pretty easy for the other guy to see something like that coming and, and back away or, or whatever the case may be. Again, if you're not really well versed in what you're doing, but if you can get somebody pinned up against the fence, they can't go anywhere. Like there's not, they're not sprawling out of the leg lock. They're not running away from the leg lock. Like, dude, like they're stuck. They're against the fence. They're not going anywhere. So my biggest recommendations in terms of watching people do that would be um, Paul Harris obviously does it quite a bit. And then there's another guy. Uh, he was, I think he was most recently fighting in belts or maybe he fought in the UFC a little bit. Marcin Held, I competed against him also. Um, he, he does quite a bit of uh, leg locks and mixed martial arts and was fairly successful in his career. And uh, he also goes for a lot of entries off of the cage. Um, and those are two people that I would look at um, to integrate uh, leg locks in MMA. Um, and it again, it makes it a little bit more controlled um, less likely they're going to get away from you, more likely that you're actually going to get your entry off. Right. Sure. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Okay. Now, no, no, it's okay. Now the next conversation I'll have is I had mentioned to you that in a more skilled athlete like myself or somebody that's been doing this for a while, they would want to, they or sorry, not they would want to, they would have, you know, a uh, plan B, a plan C, you know, all of these sorts of things for when things don't work out. Now those plans kind of change a little bit in the context of punching, but still theoretically they'd have an ability to kind of fix things if they got messed up, which is something that if the unskilled athlete or the, the green athlete to leg locks wouldn't be able to do so much. It's like, Hey, if everything works out, I might be able to finish this move, but I don't really know what to do when problems start. Right. So that's the kind of the problem with being inexperienced. You don't really know. Remember we talked about learning how to problem solve. Well, like now you're problem solving on the fly. Like, and if you don't, if you haven't been doing it, the chances of you being able to problem solve on the fly are probably minimal. So the, the number one aspect of what to do when things go wrong that I would want an athlete to learn, even if they were relatively green. So this would be the, you know, one level above just doing the things that I had mentioned, which is going for a leg lock in the last 30 seconds. And as far as where to do it, do it while you're pinning your your opponent up against the cage. The last thing I would say is um, have a ability when your opponent tries to evade the movement to either get back up or get to their back, right? Get back up or get to their back. When, because often people turn out of leg locks, right? Or they kick out of leg locks. And if you can't capitalize on the ability, or, or sorry, if you can't capitalize on the opportunity when your training partner kicks a leg away, so there's distance being created between you and your opponent, or in the case of him turning, there's back exposure being created between you and your opponent, and you go to get to their back. And even if you don't get to their back, you get up, you accomplish the first objective, right? If you can't do that off of your failed attempts, I'm a little bit more scared for you to try that in mixed martial arts competition, because now I'm convinced that if something goes wrong, you're stuck on bottom eating punches more than likely. Of course, there are also things that you could learn tactically to try to avoid getting hit while you're in leg locking situations. Again, that kind of like moves moves forward into a little bit of a higher level of, of thinking though. Like if I'm, if I'm teaching you stuff like that, you've already gotten past the other things that I just mentioned to you, okay. right? If you had a, I'm teaching you how to uh, create distance with your legs to make it hard for somebody to punch. You know, I would have, I would have gone over all the other previous information before I taught you that. Um, and then when it comes to somebody who's skilled, so let's say somebody crosses over from jujitsu to MMA and they've been doing leg locks for a long time and they want to use them in MMA. I would just say similarly that like, don't, don't undervalue the idea of coming up from bottom and getting back up or exposing the person's back off of your leg locking attempts. And don't be, don't be as obsessed perhaps as you would be in a jujitsu match of like, I have to find a way to get the submission here because tactically speaking, it might not be the best choice. Because unlike in a jiu-jitsu match where after the guy turns out of the first leg lock, he still has to grapple you. Right. You have to happen in MMA. You know, like the guy gets out of the first leg lock attempt and now he might just be standing over you trying to punch you in the face. And now your decision to try to keep chasing him and climbing the leg or maybe even switch legs or 
whatever other normal thing that you would might have might do in jujitsu kind of like put you in a, in a worse spot, you know, and that's the, that's the cautionary tale that I would tell the person that knows what they're doing, you know, in a jujitsu match or sorry, that knows what they're doing um, in uh, leg locking going into MMA. But as far as the question as a whole, you know, which is probably what it was meant to be was like a simple question, but I just expanded upon it. Like, Oh, it's um, perfect, man. As far as the question as a whole, like, yeah, of course it can be effective. Like, I mean, we've seen people get submitted in leg locks in, in MMA on a regular enough basis that you can't call it a fluke. Like, oh yeah, you know, we, we even, you know, especially when you have a specific athlete like a Paul Harris, that's able to do it to many high level guys in a row and be successful, you know, obviously has his own other problems, but clearly, clearly he was able to, to apply that in a way that was very, very dangerous to many, many different people. Um, and be successful. We've already had athletes do it, you know, right. and even when you don't see one athlete that only dominates like that, we've also seen other athletes uh, that have jumped in there and, um, uh, and like, you know, every once in a while they'll get a leg lock, you know, yeah. that's the way that they're, you know, that's the way that it works. They, they just kind of use it as like a, Hey, if I end up entangled in the guy's legs, I'm going to give it a shot. Um, my, uh, one of the guys I trained Ryan Benoit, uh, unfortunately he actually just got pulled off, uh, the UFC card tomorrow. He had a bad weight cut. Oh, shit. Um, yeah, he, uh, in his previous fight, he almost knee barred the guy. Um, cause he just, he was in the context of a, of a grappling exchange. The legs got tangled and it's like, okay, well, let's give it a shot. You know, the game plan for that fight wasn't knee bar the guy, right. <laughs> you know, Ryan is not a leg lock specialist. I mean, he's capable of submitting somebody on the legs. He's not a specialist. I don't, I don't go into any of his fights for the most part and go, yeah, the plan is let's invert it. He'll hook this guy. Like, nah, I, I leave it on the table as a potential, um, you know, but, but again, you know, that's kind of how, that's how I would say most people in MMA should be using it. It's like, Hey man, we get into a leg entanglement. Like, you know, there, this is another opportunity to win this fight. Why not? Why not explore it? Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I mean, and just with my limited knowledge, in mixed martial arts. I've, I've never fought professionally. I, I mean, I've trained for fighting, you know, as like a police officer. Right. And I've been training with, uh, Trent and Ryan. So I have a couple guys in my gym that, that fight amateur. Right. And so they hold different ball game, right. If you just used to training straight jujitsu for those that are listening and then you go put on some, just putting on MMA gloves and grappling is a whole different ball game. Sure. Um, it's just, man, my, I remember the first time I, I did it and I had some six ounce gloves on and my fucking, my fucking grip, dude, holy shit. I can't even open my car door. It was, it was a complete game changer for me. Um, but you know, I think that your approach and how you approach that from novice to intermediate to professional is, is a great way to put it. And that's, I mean, that can really be applied with any type of skill set, Right. I mean, cause there's guys that are known for, so I had Tiago Alves on, um, oh, yeah a while back and he had he told me in his first professional fight um he got armbarred and didn't know what the fuck happened cuz mm. he never he was just uh, he was just a striker right and uh, he's got a fucking nasty leg kick right so he, i mean just like he said like he's like i didn't i did not want to go to the ground with somebody because i i didn't know jiu jitsu he's like my coach was yelling at me to tap or my arm was going to fucking explode you know um he said and then i he's like well, then i figured i should probably learn some grappling you know, <laughs> but he, uh, but you know, it, it's actually, it's such a similar kind of mindset. It's like, you know, he knew his game, right. And you know, your game, like you are, I love when you go for that single leg and then you go for your leg entry. I think that's, it's, yeah. it's phenomenal. And it, it's super, great, super highly effective. Great entry also, by the way, I had mentioned like, you know, more easy access entries. It's also a good entry. I just think that the wall is a little superior because the person can't move, but that's another good way to go about it. It's like, Hey man, I shoot for your legs. As long as I can get a hold of one of them, there you go. There's that's, your leg. Yeah, that's 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 a wrap. You know, Gary, I um, you know, I think what you do, man, is is great, and the content you put out is just well. First off, it's hilarious. Um, I love your sense of humor. I think that you guys, you know, I'm just like I had Craig on. Like, win or lose, you guys have one of the best sense of humors. I know Gordon takes some stuff a little more seriously than most, or you know, he's a huge shit talker. He does follow the page, man. Like he'll comment on some stuff, and it's you know, just what you would expect Gordon to say. Um, but it's uh man, I just, 
I love how you guys approach martial arts. You approach the competition. Um, you know, I really, there's so many questions. I could fucking talk to you all day and I know you're a busy man. I know you're training. And, um, so are you currently, so you're currently living in Puerto Rico. Like you have your own place, you're, you're, yeah. you're set up. Is it kind of, I know Craig told me, he said, everything's a little bit slower here than in New York. A little bit is a nice way to say it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just very like, you know, it's very inefficient, um, very disorganized, uh, getting things done is difficult. There's a lot of hoops to jump through with things and, you know, people just don't, it's not, you know, uh, the culture in the East coast is, it's kind of very much like, man, I'm going to like, I'm going to put my effort into doing this thing to get a better result. And that's kind of like how I'm going to do life overall. Like maybe you won't do it with everything, but you'll do it with the things that mean something to you and what interests you and stuff like that. And it's, it doesn't resonate with the culture here as much. I mean, there's obviously people that do, you know, we have this guy, Fernando, that helps us out at combat 360 that like, I mean, man, anything that the guy does, like he's, you know, high, he's on, he's on top of it. You know, he's, he's, he's trying his absolute best to get things done. Um, and you know, as quickly as he, or as efficiently as he could. And with the least amount of, of, uh, you know, hoops to jump through or whatever the case may be, he's going to try to find a way to help you. Um, and then like, you'll go to a restaurant and it's like completely different, you know, like from somebody coming over to ask you what you want to eat or drink or to when everything's done getting the bill. It's like, it's a whole in, in, New York, New Jersey, these places that you live, it's like, man, it's a, it's a conveyor belt, man. It's right. one thing after another, after another, there's a sequence of events that's going to happen. And here it's just kind of like, yeah, whatever, whatever. It's just chill. It's just slower. But in addition to that, you know, there are, it's, it's so hard to explain this to somebody without like giving very specific examples that are monotonous and boring, but there are also like times where, it's not just about being relaxed. There are literally things like, okay, I'll give you a brief example without trying to be too boring. No, you're good. So like I live in a, in a, uh, an apartment complex that is, uh, like a gated apartment complex. So it's like very safe. Like there's no question, like there's no issues here whatsoever with like, you know, <clears throat> crime or, you know, people stealing things or anything like that. It's not like I'm living in like a random house you know, in the middle of, uh, of the city where there's like a lot going on or pretty, you know, in Dorado where we're at, we're actually pretty far set aside from, you know, uh, what is it called? Uh, San Juan and stuff like that. So, so when I get things delivered here, man, uh, at the apartment, they come to my apartment with a slip of paper that they have to print out put my name on, put the number of my apartment, all of these sorts of things and say, Hey, you have 48 hours to pick up your, your package, you know, at the administration desk, or we're going to send it back, which by the way, that doesn't actually happen, but I guess that's like their threat. So that like you go pick up your package, right? Right. Dude, nine times out of 10, the package is like the same size as the fucking slip that they handled me, handed me. And they have like, they have like a, what's it called? Um, um, like these little go-karts that they drive around in. Oh, golf carts, right? Yeah. So little golf carts that they drive around in. They have plenty of room. It's not like they don't have an ability <laughs> to transport. So like, instead of giving me that slip of paper and making me go to admit, so they made more work for themselves and for me, you know, like they had to come to my apartment to deliver the slip of paper anyway. They could have literally just dropped the package off, right? Like, yeah. You, you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, like, that doesn't make any sense. You could you just drop the package off. <laughs> yeah. And then you might say, oh, well, it might get stolen. It's like, no, like, I'm telling you, like, this is a very, there's nothing happening in this place. I'm good. I'm good. Like that. Yeah, you're good to go. And okay. So even if you were to argue with me on that one, okay, I got another one for you. My landlord. Okay. My landlord sends me a, uh, sends me a letter. Okay. A fucking letter, bro. And not handwritten, but like, it's typed out, but it's clearly like not, this is not something that's at least the slip that I'm getting is like a reproduced slip with the exception of my apartment number. So like, it's probably already made up. Nobody has to type it out. Right. This is like a full letter that this chick 
that's my landlord typed out to send to me telling me that I owe her some money. No problem. Like she like switched over the utilities or something and paid for a month of the utilities. So I like owed her like a couple hundred bucks. Okay, dude, I have her number. She has my number. We both have texted each other before about the air conditioning units multiple times. She could have just sent me a text and said, hey man, you owe me 150 bucks. And I would have been like, okay, no worries. Instead, she fucking wrote out this letter, put it in an envelope, fucking wrote both of our addresses on it, put a stamp on it, drove it to the fucking post office. Then I, then she had to wait for it to get delivered. Then I got it. Then I opened it up. And guess what I did when I fucking opened it up? I fucking texted her and said, hey, no problem. I'm going to pay you your money. It's like, why would you go through all that? It makes no – do you just have all the time in the world? You have nothing better to do? Like you could have just texted me. Like it made more work for both of us. It made no sense. You know what I mean? It's so funny you say that because you literally sound just like Craig was. He was like <laughs> – he was like, dude, literally, like I was trying to get internet, just internet. He goes, yeah. it took four ever. You know, yeah. I, it's just coming from New York. Um, so I have some family there and I can understand it's just like you said, it's, it's like, it's like, it's like a conveyor belt, hustle and bustle, yeah. rush, rush, rush. And everything's so merit-based. It's like, if you do better at your job, like it's, it's like a necessary thing. Right. Like on some level to be good at whatever it is that you do, or at least competent, right? Like, like the bare minimum, it's, it's not really necessary here. Like, I don't think people care. Well, uh, that's <laughs> probably just the lifestyle. I'm, I'm assuming I don't, I've never, I've never actually been to Puerto Rico. So I, I've been to Costa Rica, which I would, yeah. I would assume is probably similar. Maybe I don't, mm-hmm. I, don't I don't know where there's some like super nice parts and there's like sure. not so many nice parts, you know? Sure. Um, so you guys, so now you're at Combat 360 right now, super small gym. Um, are you guys building? Yeah, we're working on it. We, we we would have been done already, but the first place that we were trying to get kind of fell through. They kept kind of fucking playing games with us, man. They were like, they like tried to move somebody else in and then they raised prices. It was a whole fucking disaster. Like they wanted like, dude, they wanted like 20K per month in rent for like the spot that we were renting. And like, dude, like that would have been an absurd price for like, Jersey or maybe even New York, depending upon where you 20K are. 20K a month? Yeah, it was it was nuts. Whatever they whatever they were asking was kind of crazy. So we ended up uh they it wasn't didn't start that way. I think it was initially 10k a month or something, which was more reasonable for this for this. We were getting a very big space, but um dude, like in Puerto Rico, it just didn't make any sense, you know. Yeah, and 20k and sounds about, like uh sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and we're talking about like these are plazas that are like vacant. Like there's like multi, there's like only a few businesses in them. It's like they need clients, right? right. It's crazy for them to be trying to upcharge so much. So we found a better spot. Um, I'm not really involved with all of it. I'm just, this is all hearsay. You know, I'm not part of the ownership of the gym or anything like that, that we're going to be opening. I'm sure I'll teach there, but um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to having a cage to training. And again, cause right now I don't, which sucks. I don't, I like training in a cage. It's nice to be able to back people up right now. I, People can run away from me too much. Yeah. I don't like it. It's just a wall, a padded wall. Yeah, it means I have to punch people more. I don't like <laughs> yeah, so I mean that's well, that's good. You guys are actually building school because I had a buddy that just went down there and he was he was trying to see if he could get a private from one of you guys and they were just like there's no room down here right now. We don't have any room. Like we barely have room to train, you know? Yeah. Um because I just Art. I just there's watched y'all's uh flow has my money, unfortunately. Um <laughs> <laughs> but I just watched your, uh, you guys are doing a little segue, a little series over there. And so I just, yeah. I just finished watching that. And it seems like a super small, super small school. Yeah. So that's the thing, man. It's a smaller school. It's, and like, man, every, every time for every, every person that you know, that has been trying to, has come down here and couldn't train. There's another fucking hundred that were here that at the same man. time that have been messaging us and asking us, it's so hard, man, to get people in. And like, yeah, occasionally we allow visitors and stuff, but like, it's tough, man, because there's just, there's limited space. If we let everybody in that was asking to get in, we would not have enough room to grapple, you know? Yeah. Um, so do you do any type of, uh, you know, seminar tours? I, I know uh, Craig just did his, was stimulus package tour or whatever. 
Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a lazy piece of shit. Um, so <laughs> no. Um, sure, I, Gary. Yeah, no. I, that's lazy is not the right word. The the right word is like. So the amount that Gordon cares about money is the exact opposite that I feel about money for the most part. <laughs> like, I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. don't get me wrong. Like I'm dude, I, I went through some periods in my life where fucking shit was rough, like yeah. sleeping in gyms and shit. Like it's, it's not, it was a, it was a tough time and I'm happy to no longer be in a, in a place of financial need like that. But man, when my bills are paid for and like I can buy whatever I want to eat, like <laughs> I'm good to go, man. Like, Absolutely, man. That's a, that's such a good mindset. So, so man, like I'm focused on the, on my goals right now. And like, my goals are like, you know, for the school that I, that I own, like I want that to get better. So I, I do things to try to help that. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, I'm obviously focused on my mixed martial arts career. So, you know, I spend the majority of my time, bringing in different athletes to train with and figuring out when my next fight's going to be and all that kind of stuff. And, um, I think I probably won't teach any seminars until after the, uh, until after the next fight. Um, you know, I'll take a little bit of time, not off, but I'll take some time to go do some stuff like that. Maybe, maybe, but maybe I should probably do it more, man. You know, I do, I do know that there's kind of a window for all of this, but I don't know. You know, I've been planning to teach jujitsu for a long time. And I think that, you know, I think that with the accomplishments that I have and stuff, I'll be a sought after name well after my competitive career is over. So I'll have time to do a lot more teaching, but I do teach seminars here and there, you know, uh, every once in a while, something will pop up or I'm traveling somewhere and I go, ah, you know, I'll teach a seminar here. A lot of my, my shit's super last minute when I do it. Um, but I haven't done like, man, I haven't done like a seminar tour in like long time, man. Yeah. So, and getting my my training stuff done so um yeah cool man so gary i uh i really do appreciate your time and man i have so many other questions for you but i know you uh i know you have to go work out at 2 a.m so i don't want to keep you from that um so uh gary where can people find you um i know you just launched a new clothing brand correct am i correct? so i own an apparel company called cash chicks championships um but I am now working with uh, the t-shirt that you see on me now. If anybody's watching this via video, uh, it's called skilled violence. Um, that's not my company, but it's a good close friend of mine, um, Mike Smith. And um, he's a really good dude. Um, he's putting together some cool stuff. I love, I love the name too. It's very synonymous with like the kind of stuff that we do. You know, we tr- try to apply, you know, some level of, you know, technique and skill to violence, if you will. Absolutely. You know? So, uh, I, I like the idea. I really love working with people that, you know, that I'm friendly with, uh, as well, instead of just working with some random brand that, you know, it's, it's just kind of a financial thing. So, um, yeah, man, they're, they're super cool. Uh, they're actually integrating with my company cash Chicks championships. So they're going to start offering some, uh, you know, some different apparel. His wife, Heidi is in the, in the works with, uh, making some cool new stuff for cash Chicks championships. So, I'm excited about that. So you should, should be looking forward to seeing some stuff on the apparel end of things. Um, you know, and not too long. Um, my school is called Gary Tone and Jitsu is located in uh, North Brunswick, New Jersey. It's like central Jersey, pretty close to Rutgers university, roughly. Um, it is inside a, the UFC gym, North Brunswick. We uh, basically rent mat space from them and uh, we hold our classes there. Chris Sodbanow, my Brown belt um is currently the head instructor there he's very very talented um you know and uh i i think he's a really excellent coach he's been really coming into his own since he started running the program there i'm very excited for him um so that program's still running very strong great group of guys over there that are training i try to come there like once a month um we're going to be coming out with some apparel from from the school as well that'll be like gary tone and jiu-jitsu stuff we just changed the uh, the, the branding of the gym. It used to be Brunswick BJJ. So now it's Gary Tony Jiu Jitsu. I got a couple affiliates out in Jersey as well. Um, Immortals Jiu Jitsu. And I want to say that's maybe near Caldwell, New Jersey. It's like up north. It's North Jersey, but I can't say for sure. I forget. It's my buddy Mike Rockshan's gym. Um, and Sean, I forget Sean's last name. Um, but they're both, both super good. And uh, you know, great guys to work with. Um, I had another affiliate. Um, nah, what was I going to say? All in jujitsu, which is Damian Anderson, who's my main, uh, one of my main MMA training partners and jujitsu training partners. Um, he owns that school along with Andrew Vidal, one of my brown belts. 
um, who's also very talented. So if you guys are around, uh, I want to say the uh, Middlesex is the name of the city because there's a Middlesex County and there's a Middlesex uh, city. And uh, I think it's Middlesex, the city. And uh, that's not too far off from my academy. It's like 25 minutes uh, from my academy. Um, so they, they run a program out there. And then I got one other affiliate um, in um, little, it's hard. It's confusing. Cause there's, this is one of those places in Jersey where there's like a bunch of different variations of the same name. I want to say it's little leg Harbor. But it's so hard because there's like, there's like Little Egg Harbor, Egg Harbor Township. And then like, it's, I don't know. There's a bunch yeah, of them. Over. Yeah. There's a lot of townships in New Jersey. Yeah. So I'm not hundred percent sure which one it is, but some, somewhere in the Harbor Egg area, whatever is Harbor <laughs> Jiu-Jitsu. Okay. You can look that up. Uh, my buddy, Al Bruce has been running that program. He was actually my first affiliate. Um, he's a, he's a super good guy too. He runs his, his program out, out of a, uh, what was that? Uh, uh, Attilus. He runs it out of an Attilus gym. That that gym that was famous for uh, you know standing up to the lockdowns and all that right. stuff. Um, he he runs out of there near Atlantic City. So um, those are all my affiliates. We, we cover my clothing. And as far as finding me, it's pretty easy. Gary Tonin on Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Uh, I would say on Twitter, it's mostly random thoughts and maybe like some fight announcements and stuff. And then Instagram is probably more of my personality and little funny videos and promotional stuff. You see a good mix, a lot of ass pictures. If you're following my story, you yes, know, <laughs> That's always why. I mean, Gary, I think you're great, but you're sure you're great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, Gary, you are, uh, you know, I can say that I've looked up for you for many years and just kind of like I told Craig, I was like, uh, you have no idea who I am, but I know exactly who you guys are. And you guys um, are such are are such professional practitioners. I know you guys joke around and have a good time, but you guys are the best in the world. And it is uh, and it is an honor for me to even have you on this podcast. Um, I told only a few people that I was having you on, um, and obviously they'll know after after sure. having you on. But I would love to have you back. Um, yeah, if, and if you're ever in Charleston, South Carolina, or I come to Puerto Rico. Um, we'll definitely hang out. I'll buy you a steak and, awesome. uh, and, um, I'm going to try to, uh, leg lock you. <laughs> Dude, man, you guys, uh, check out Gary's instructionals. Um, escaping the system. I can tell you right now, I've already bought it. It's on my list to watch once I get through all the other 425 <laughs> DVDs that I've bought. Cause BJJ fanatics actually just fucking texted me that there's a 40% off sale. So I'm going to go ahead and might go ahead and <laughs> hop on that. Gary, it's been an absolute pleasure, brother. And we'll be in touch. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for having me on. Enjoy. And, and, and honestly, man, thank you so much for the, uh, the stuff that you do with, uh, with your, your Instagram and stuff. I man. appreciate that. It is a great, um, it is a great departure from the majority of the uh, posts and information that you get um, when viewing police videos um, online. And I think like what you guys do with that page is a really important thing for, you know, uh, just everybody in the community um, because I think it helps people wrap their head around a little bit more exactly like what a, what a police officer's job is, what they're there to do, what the protocol is, how they should be doing it, how they could do it better in some cases. And you guys address a lot of those issues in a very clear, concise, rational way that I think are a little bit easier for people to understand. And, and that's, that's, I think a lot of the confusion that goes on with, uh, with some of these things is people just don't understand, you know, they're not police officers, right? So they don't, they don't get it. You know, they don't know, the same way that like somebody wouldn't understand how to use leg locks in a fucking mixed martial arts fight, you know, exactly. they don't understand how, uh, you know, a, a law enforcement officer uh, would is expected to conduct themselves around different threats. And, um, you know, I know that's where a lot of the, the misconceptions and the animosity and stuff come from. And it's unfortunate, but I think that pages like yours do a good job of it of not just like saying oh no you know like you guys are actually attempting to educate which is great and i think that's really really helpful so thank you for that